All right, let's uh, take a look at the mess that I've made. Hey, what's up guys? My name is Ashona. Welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna be taking a look at a bit of a post-mortem, bit of a self-reflection and code analysis, if you wanna call it that, of the game that I made in an hour using my engine, Hazel. So if you guys haven't seen that video, I'll have it linked like in the top, you know, corner or whatever. Um, and I'll and in the description as well. Basically, I made a game in an hour. It was um, supposed to be something that was kind of a learning exercise for Hazel and also, uh, I guess, something to help us understand what exactly the engine needs. Um, I mean, the engine needs a lot of things. That was pretty clear, but still, it's really good to even at a very early stage in the engine's development to kind of sit down and be like, all right, I'm gonna make a game in an hour using the engine. Well, an hour is a bit extreme, obviously, I had to make the video interesting, but in general, just sitting down, maybe spending a day or two, just trying to make a very simple game. So in this case, it was kind of like a little Flappy Bird clone made by uh, this guy called Danny. Um, and I basically just set out to completely copy that in my own engine and see what I could do. So that was good because I didn't need to think about any ideas and I could take an existing product that someone had actually made inside a game engine, in this case Unity, and actually try and recreate it. And obviously, um, because it was something that was actually made in a game engine like Unity, which has things like, you know, post-processing and like particle effects and collision detection um, and all of this kind of stuff, uh, it was, re it, you know, it was, clearly made with technology that was capable of being called a game engine and capable of actually making a game like this. So it's good to kind of uh, take that and try and make it in your own primitive engine. And in fact, like I t I've talked about this before in other videos, but it's super important to um, actually use a game engine like Unity if you're building a game engine yourself. Um, you know, if you're all like a game engine purist, you're like, nah, I've got my own engine, I don't want to use anything else. Like, that's not really a good approach. I mean, sure, like, you do, no one's telling you to ship a game using Unity or whatever if you don't want to. But if you are building a game engine, it makes sense to take a look at other game engines. If I'm producing a song or I'm trying to, like, write a record, sorry, I'm into audio these days. Um, but if I'm, if I'm like producing a song or something like that, and I've got no reference, I'm not like listening to what's out there or how other, you know, stuff that I like is produced, like that doesn't make much sense, does it? So it's the same kind of concept with game engines. Um, you know, if you're trying to build a good, a good game engine, you need to see other successful products like Unity and Unreal. And the cool thing is like, you'll see issues with them as well. Don't be like, oh, you know, I, I need to copy them entirely. Like, no, even those, and even those engines themselves will have issues because again, they're trying to be really generalist for your specific game, for your specific use case. They're probably not going to be ideal at all. So it's good to kind of take that and, and and actually dissect it and see what's up. So that's kind of what I did in a way. Um, I mean, I didn't use Unity myself for this specific project, but I was able to take something that was made in Unity and then try and recreate it in my own engine and see what that path would look like. Okay, so anyway, today, let's take a look at a bit of a reflection on what on earth code I wrote. Um, and to be fair, the whole game was about, I think, two and a half hours it took me because um, the base game I did make in about an hour, but because Hazel doesn't have a lot of things, um, I had to add in a whole bunch of systems, a whole bunch of engine side systems, really. I did them in the client side, but engine side systems, like particle systems, and uh, like I had to, well, well, collision was a big one, I think, but um, I had to like hack the UI for the score and stuff using IM GUI. There were a few things that were way less than ideal that I had to do, and that was as a result of Hazel just not being, like not having those features yet. Um, so that really slowed me down, and because of that, I kind of had to, um, take longer than, than the hour. But I guess the goal with this as well is to, to take this and be like, okay, well, we now know what Hazel needs. Let's kind of maybe work towards a version of Hazel where it really would take an hour to make that specific game with all of the effects and everything, right? Um, that's kind of the goal. And that's cool that we have that goal now as a result of taking that time to actually make a game. That's why I keep saying it's so important to do something like that. Um, but anyway, I guess I'll just get into this. So. We'll take a look at the code in a minute. Um, I just want to give you my thoughts to begin with. Um, now this was like, I think this was about two weeks ago that I did this. So unfortunately I didn't have time to record this video like almost two weeks ago while it was still fresh in my mind. So it's been a while. Um, I mean, ultimately, ultimately I think the experience was about the same as what I expected. Um, I didn't, I, I, you know, I mean, I watched the video first as you guys saw in, in that video, right? I watched uh, Danny's video first and I kind of um, took notes and I knew that like, you know, Hazel doesn't have collision. Hazel, Hazel doesn't have a particle system. Hazel can't do like post-processing bloom or anything like that. 
right? How are we going to do all of this stuff? I knew that it would be a little bit rough. But that being said, obviously, it was a simple game. Like, he could have done a lot more, like, a lot more advanced things. Obviously, not saying that that's relevant to the game design at all. I'm just thinking, like, te technically, like, on a technical level, you know, it's not hard to easily drop stuff into Unity that would make it almost impossible to achieve in Hazel within like a, a very small amount of time because we would have to write the rest of the engine. But um, in general, luckily it was kind of really downscale. It was kind of easy. Um, and because of that, we were able to add things like the particle system, you know, in like, I think I wrote the particle system in about half an hour maybe um, because it's it was just quads. Like they weren't even textured, right? We didn't have to deal with that. Um, it was super easy to do. Uh, so... I think that kind of played to the benefit. Um, in general, like I set out to, I think my first kind of, my first thoughts were like, okay, well, let's get the, the player, right? Let's get the player and the controls working. Like that's kind of step one. Once we've got the player and the controls and I can hit spacebar, I've got that kind of, you know, physics. I mean, it, again, it didn't really have physics. Like in his version, he had the game actually, um, when the player ship collided with like, you know, the triangle, like it would kind of like slide down it. And you had that actual, you know, actual physics, um, which, you know, we could add obviously using box 2D in the future in Hazel, that's probably what I would do. Um, however, you know, for this version, I just used a very simple kind of, you know, velocity, I guess, model. I don't even know what you call it, but basically where we just have, like, we have the player's position, we have a velocity, and the player's position, we always add the velocity times the delta time every frame into that actual, like, player position. And then the velocity will either the velocity can increase and decrease based on gravity and based on player input. So that's kind of that's kind of what we what we did, um, which was fairly simple and straightforward to set up. Um, and then once I had the player being able to be controlled, and I loaded in a texture for that, obviously, and made sure that I could rotate the player, which I had to extend the engine code to do. After that, um, I was able to just simply uh, create like start creating a level around the player, um, and that's what I did. And then once we have the level and we have the random generation, which also is quite simple to do for this game, um, you know, I created a triangle texture for uh, all of the pillar positions. That I call them pillars, but um, those kind of triangle, the, the level terrain, I guess, um, because Hazel doesn't render triangles. But specifically, the reason why I actually created a triangle texture instead of going ahead and um, you know, actually just adding a draw triangle function into Hazel, because it's really easy to draw a triangle, obviously, like in OpenGL, you just, you know, we're, we're rendering two triangles, that's what our quad is. Um, but the reason I did that was because I knew that I was going to want to add that bloom effect, that glow effect. Um, and that was something that clearly I was going to have to just do in Photoshop as a texture. Because Hazel doesn't have post-processing, Hazel doesn't have any of that stuff at all. So because of that, I kind of went the texture route, which obviously presents another problem, which is like to do with collision boundaries and stuff, which I also had to add in, which was uh, probably the part that took the longest and was the most annoying. Um, it wasn't like that annoying, but it's, it's just not ideal. Anyway, I think we should just jump into the code because I'm, I'm sending up that I'm explaining the code anyway, and it's gonna be easier if I actually show it. So let's just take a look at what we've got here. Okay, so I thought that we should probably start at the beginning. So this is where the application actually starts. We have this create application function that we implement in the client side. This is inside the sandbox app file here. And basically all this does is it returns new sandbox, which is this class, which is a Hazel application. And then the only thing that really does is pushes this game layer onto the layer stack. So if you're new to Hazel and you're not sure what layers are, I recommend that you check out the Game Engine series, specifically the episode on layers, because that um, explains it pretty well. But basically, a layer is just um, something that will receive updates from the game loop. So in other words, you can see this layer on update with the time step. This happens every single application loop. Um, and also it will receive events here in reverse order of the actual layer stack. So in other words, um, you probably have like a layer for your actual game, maybe a layer for debug UI or something like that, or just regular UI on top of that, stuff that, that is maybe clickable so that it doesn't interfere with your game logic or anything like that. Um, that's kind of the idea. For this game, obviously really simple. We just have one layer because we have an hour to write the whole game. Nothing too fancy at all. So um, inside the game layer, the first thing that runs is of course the constructor. First thing we're doing here is creating the camera. Um, so the reason I'm doing this is because, um, okay, so I'm, I'm arbitrarily picking an orthographic camera width here of eight. And again, this basically just means that, well, actually it's the width, the total width is 16 because we're doing negative cam width to top cam width. 
And in fact, um, that's the camera height, not the width. But anyway, um, what this is doing is we're basically setting up our units in a way, right? So we're saying that this, this is, these are the orthographic camera bounds. So relative to these units is going to be the size of everything else we render. So in other words, if I, you know, if I know that from top to bottom, you know, we're dealing with like 16 units, right? Then I might make my player one by one unit because that way it would kind of be like one sixteenth of the entire um, vertical space that we have. If I had made this like 80 instead of eight, then it might make more sense for the player to be 10 by 10 units big, right? So this is all kind of arbitrary and relevant or rather relative to this specific like orthographic projection that you set up. And I think I actually started with 10, um, but then I reduced it to eight when we wanted the camera to kind of follow the player and zoom in on the player more. Um, and then the reason I made this like into a function is because uh, on window resize, when we resize the window, we want to be able to um, actually recreate the camera because the aspect ratio might have changed. So we need to kind of take that into consideration. Otherwise we'll get, you know, distorted graphics. Um, and then we initialize this random uh, class that I quickly wrote. So this is basically just using like C++ 11, I guess. Um, that kind of random uh, number generation engine that they provide, which is this one over here. Um, and then basically we're just seeding it in the beginning. Uh, and then I think we're creating a distribution with no actual, because you can provide a bounds for this distribution, but I'm just saying, you know, no bounds at all. So it'll go up to, I think the maximum value of a UN32T, which is like 4.2 billion. Um, and then what that, so what that's doing is this is generating a number between like zero and 4.2 billion. And then what we're doing is dividing it by that maximum numeric limit. Um, of a UN32T. So we're getting basically a value between zero and one, a float between zero and one. And this is really useful because we can take this float and we can, since it's between zero and one, you know, we can multiply it with any number we want. Um, and we kind of get a random number between those bounds, if that makes sense. So in other words, if I multiply this with 50, then I'll get a number from zero all the way up to 50. Um, based on, you know, what the float is. So if it generates 0 0.5, then that will be, you know, 25. Um, so that's kind of really powerful and lets us do something like that really easily without having to like specify parameters that are like, I want a random number between these bounds or whatever. Uh, and you'll see that in use in the level class a bit later on as well. Okay, anyway, I think I might go through this a bit quicker because this is gonna take forever if I just do it this way. Um, you know, I'm initiating, uh, initializing this level class here. Uh, I think that I, I mean, these are all kind of, these are all kind of, this level is like entirely on the stack and everything. So um, I can't do anything in the constructor because it gets default constructed, I think immediately, you know, and it, well, either that or I'd have to like initialize it here. But by just having this init function, I'm kind of bypassing that in a way and saying that, well, actually I want you to initialize it here because we need to load like um, textures and stuff. And we want OpenGL to have already been like created at, at this point. And by created, I'm specifically referring to the context. Um, all right. so. Loading our triangle texture, which is uh, the level kind of building block. So this is the one that eventually, you know, we, let's see, triangle. This is the one that eventually we added the glow to. So don't know why the background's green, it's just Visual Studio and wanting to make it green for some reason, but you can see we've got that kind of glow effect on it, which looks quite nice. Um, all right, so we're loading in that texture, then we're loading in the player's assets, which is really just the ship texture. Um, so we're getting all that out of the way once when we attach our game layer. Um, and then we're just setting up a new font as well. Uh, this is just the Open Sans font, size 120, um, which I just got from GitHub. This is the actual font here. Um, and then I think that's about it. So from there, well, I mean the player, yeah, that, that's actually it, I think. Level in it probably doesn't do anything else. Uh, well, yeah, it does the, the pillar generation. So this is us creating the pillars. Um, not sure what, okay, so the way that I structured this um, is we basically have, this is kind of interesting to talk about. I'm going to probably revert to talking about more complicated parts of this because otherwise I'm serious. This is going to be like two hours long and I could talk about this for two hours, but uh, no, I don't think anyone wants that. So um, basically we have five pillars, right? And I just closed level. So that's great. We have five pillars. Um, that's all we deal with, right? We have M pillars resize five. This happens in the initialization of the level, right? So once, um, and that's all we're dealing with because, well, we, the game is, the game can potentially go on forever and there's no way that we can just keep, you know, adding more and more pillars that we don't need to. We can't see more than five, um, sets of pillars. 
uh, on the screen at one time. And by sets, I just mean the top and the, and the bottom one. We can't see more than five at a time anyway, so let's always just have a maximum of five and then we'll just recycle them. When we get to the end, you know, we'll take that first one and we'll add it to the front again. Um, and we'll kind of keep going that way until we, well, it'll just keep going forever, which is nice. So what we're doing here is there's two parameters for this create pillar function. There's the index, which is the index into that um, vector, into this pillars vector that it's actually going to create the pillar at. And then we have an offset, which is just a horizontal offset into the level. So this is the actual level position um, of the pillar. So the position of the pillar inside the level. So top and bottom position, X specifically, there's top, there's top and bottom for most of these things. Uh, the top is the top pillar, so the top triangle, and then the bottom is the bottom triangle. And then all we're doing here is we're basically saying that, okay, well, X, the X is going to be whatever the horizontal offset is. So in this case, you can say, because I'm creating the first five pillars of the entire level, I'm basically just saying that it's going to be I times 10. So in other words, we'll have one pillar at 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, and that, well, that's it. 0, 10, 20, 30, 40. Okay, we have five pillars. Um, those are the horizontal, those are the X positions. And then for the Z position, so this is a bit tricky. The reason is we need these to render, we need these to blend with each other well, right? If they have the same Z index, then when they get rendered, they might get rendered that when the depth testing happens and the blending happens inside OpenGL, inside our actual like GPU rendering, um, it, it might potentially render the pillars in the wrong order, not really render them in the wrong order, but because of their Z values, when it comes time to blend them together, it's not gonna know if something is in front or behind, and it's not gonna be able to blend those pixels well, which means that basically our glow will be cut off, but we want our glow to smoothly blend together. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically saying that you know, start with, um, and these are arbitrary values. We've set our camera's projection to be between negative one and one. But basically, we're just saying that, you know, start with negative 0 0.5 based on the index of the pillar, um, and then, you know, increment it by 0 0.1. So basically, we end up with something from negative 0.5 to positive, well, just zero, I guess. Um, and that's going to be the Z position. And because we're doing it kind of from left to right, they end up blending well together. So that's kind of what that is for. It's just so that, and you can play around with this. By the way, the code, the, in case I didn't mention, the code for all of this is on GitHub and there'll be a link in the description below. So you can check this out for yourself and play the game for yourself. Um, but basically, uh, you know, this is just here and you can play around with this and get rid of it, for example, and see how like it won't be correct. In fact, let me just demonstrate that right now. And I haven't run this, so hopefully it, it works and everything. But if we do this, they're just not going to blend well together because they're all going to be on the same Z um, value. And yeah, you'll see what happens. So yes, yeah, so you see this, how it's cut off. That's because this texture goes to about here. And since like they're rendered on the same thing, when it, when th when this gets rendered after, it has no idea like, you know, it's like, well, do I blend with these pixels? Are they behind me? Are they in front? Well, actually they're on the same level as me. So I guess I won't blend with them. It doesn't work out very well. But if you have uh, this, then, um, you know, those pixels are not only already in like the depth buffer and they're already in the color buffer so that we can blend with them. Um, you can see that that shows up normally here. Not only are they inside that color and depth buffer and we can blend with them, but that, you know, we know that the second triangle is in front, thus we should be blending with it. So that's really important to kind of get that right. Um, okay, center and gap, this is just the random number generation. You can see what I'm doing here. Random float gives me a random float between zero and one, multiplying it by 35 and then subtracting half of that. So I basically get a number between negative 17.5 and positive 17.5, which is just you know, I've identified that's a good kind of vertical position. And then with the gap as well, I'm randomly calculating a gap, which is how far apart these should be. This, again, some pretty basic math, just to position the top and bottom pillar relative to that kind of gap and to the center so that we can kind of move them around. Um, and that's kind of, uh, that's basically all the level generation. Then on update, what we have is based on the player's position, we have this kind of moving pillar target, which is basically, um, and this is important because this is, we know that the pillars are at every 10 units, right? So because of that, what we do is we basically position this pillar target, which I think starts at 30, right? So when the player's X position reaches or surpasses four, uh, 30, right? When that's, when that, go, when that tips over 30, 
then we need to create a new pillar at whatever the pillar index is, which should be the first one, right? Zero. We're creating a new pillar and then we're moving the pillar target by 20 units. Um, so now it's 50, right? So the next time that the player, or rather, no, sorry, we're not, we're creating the pillar at 20. So it's, it's way off the screen. And then what we're doing is we're setting the, the, we're incrementing the pillar index. And if it goes above pillar size, which is four, it will wrap around and go back to zero. Um, and then we're just incrementing pillar target by 10, which means that the next time the player crosses that boundary, we need to generate an another pillar. So that's basically how we keep generating pillars, right? We're just, we just have a little target. And then when we cross over the target, it's almost like a little trigger box. When we cross over that trigger box over that target, then we move that trigger box to the next, like between pillars area. Um, and then we just, uh, we just create a new pillar basically at some place that is in the future kind of off screen forward in the positive X axis. Okay. So, um, what's next? Uh, collisions probably interesting to talk about. So collision, um, the way the collision works, I was just thinking maybe I should save collision for another episode because there's still so much stuff to get through and collision's a big one. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll save the way the collision works um, for another episode. If you guys are interested in that, just drop a comment below and I'll make that video probably a lot sooner that way. Um, let's take a look at some more of the graphics maybe. So we have this hue shift effect. Um, so you can see that what happens is this, uh, these colors, oh, that's a hard one. Um, these colors, they just gradually shift, right? So they just go through all of the hues. So how are we doing that? So the texture that we have is just this basic white triangle, right? That we made inside Photoshop. Um, what we're doing is we're loading in that texture. And then when it comes tr time to render that texture, which is when we render our pillars, which is inside here, right? We go through all of our pillars and we do a draw quad function here. Um, so, and then we're passing in the triangle texture. We're also passing in a color and that color is something that we, if we go into here, we set that color as a uniform inside our shader. And then when it comes time to actually issue that draw call and we go into our shader, which is the texture shader, I think, um, you can see we've got this U color, uh, uh, uniform here. And then what we're doing is when we sample the texture, which is over here, we're multiplying it with that color. So that's how we get colors, right? And because, you know, this is obviously a four component color and everything, and this color is all like has an alpha channel and everything, the glow will get multiplied correctly as well. And so we get a colored triangle. Um, as for the actual hue shift effect, that's pretty simple as well. Uh, we have this M pillar HSV function here. And then what, uh, sorry, variable here. And then what we're doing is this is a hue saturation and value, I guess. HSV, I guess I've called it hue saturation, like luminance, usually value HSV. Well, HSV is fine as well. It's, value is just the luminance. But anyway, um, so we have this kind of, uh, we have this variable here. And then all we're doing is the X, the X inside this vec three is just the hue value between, uh, I think zero and one. Yeah, between zero and one. And then based on that, um, you know, we're actually, I think, expanding it to between zero and 360 because that's the kind of hue. This is something that I've just taken from the internet, um, which basically we just converts our, our HSV to RGB because we need to pass in RGB to our shader. And then that's uh, what our color is. And then we render both the floor and the ceiling and then also all of the pillars with that kind of color override. So we're just, you know, in the update, we're just cycling through those colors here. Um, that's it. It's pretty simple. The other, I guess, graphics -y thing to probably talk about is the actual, um, kind of vignette kind of lighting thing that I've got going on. Not really lighting, but, um, you can see that the corners are kind of darker and we have this light effect. If we disable that entirely, it will look drastically different. So let's go ahead and if I don't multiply it with distance here, dist, um, then this is what it looks like with no lighting. You can see it looks a lot blander and probably a lot worse. I would say I'm not the biggest fan of adding vignettes to like everything. Um, but in this case, I think for this kind of, uh, game and just, you know, if this little quick game, I guess, um, it does add quite a bit of mood to it and just makes it look a lot nicer. So that's super simple. Um, what I'm doing here is I have this, um, V screen position 
uh, varying, right? Well, kind of output from the vertex shader that I'm setting here, which is basically the it's the GL position. Um, so this will basically be the screen bounds in, I think probably the normalized device coordinates. So between negative one and one in X and Y, right? So negative one being the right side and the bottom side for Y, and then positive one being the right, sorry, I said left side is what I meant, not right side. Left side, negative one, right side, positive one. And then same with top and bottom where top is positive one and bottom is negative one. So we have that value now. And then all I'm doing here is I'm basically multiplying, uh, well, I'm calculating the distance, right? This distance function, um, which is built into GLSL. It's just giving me the distance of two vectors, basically. So the distance between um, this point, which is screen position, I'm multiplying it by 0 0.8 just to make it a bit like not as extreme. Um, so in other words, instead of negative one to one, it's zero, negative 0 0.8 to positive 0 0.8 now. Um, and then zero, which is the exact center of the screen and then I'm inversing it. So one minus that, because I know it's not gonna be above one. In fact, it's not gonna be above 0 0.8, um, but uh, that's not necessarily true actually, because it's diagonally will be more. But anyway, my point is I'm inverting it, I'm, inver I'm doing the inverse here, so that basically from that center point, as we go out, instead of the distance increasing, the distance is decreasing. So it kind of starts at one, right? If that distance is zero, and then it gradually tapers off to probably around zero. Um, and then I'm just clamping it, making sure it is actually in between zero and one, just in case. And then I'm doing a, so that by itself gives us a linear fall off now. And if I get rid of this square root, um, then what that's doing is basically just, again, and I'll just kind of uh, crash here. So the, since we're multiplying this distance value with our entire color, right? If the distance is say zero or very small, we're going to get black. And then if it's one or well, larger than one, we, it's never, it's never going to be because we're clamping it. But if it's one, which it, it will be in the dead center, then there's no change to the color because we're just multiplying the color by one. And then as we get further away, obviously that value is decreasing. So everything else gets darker and darker and darker. Now this is fine, but this kind of fall off is it's a linear fall off and it doesn't look as good as something that has a bit more of a curve to it. So enter square root um, by using a little square root fall off. You can see that it falls off a lot slower. So it kind of curves, right? If I did the opposite of a square root, which would be just like a square basically. So if I say distance equals distance times distance, this is also a curved fall off, but you can see it has the opposite effect It's the inverse of that. It falls off a lot quicker. Um, but we want it to fall off slower, so that's why I used a square root, which is not the most efficient of things, but it's fine. Um, so there we go. So that's how we get that. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that was enough detail as to how that actually works. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's simple. It's a very simple shader trick. Um, nothing too fancy going on here, but you can see it works pretty well. Okay, cool. Um, so that's basically all of the graphics stuff. The other interesting thing is the particle system, but I'm gonna have a separate video just about basically writing a particle system in an hour probably. And that's, we're just gonna cover a lot, a lot of that in more detail then, um, cause this video is dragging on long enough. But uh, yeah, I think that's probably about it. There's not much to it, to be honest. Um, there's obviously all this game state, but that's, you know, pretty simple. We just have like, three different game states. And based on that, we decide, you know, what UI to render. We decide what, you know, if, if the game state is play, then we're update, we update the level, otherwise we don't. So in other words, when we hit something and it's game over, you can see the level stops updating, which means that these particles stop updating and everything like that. But then when we click on the screen, which is inside this on event function, and it's time to this on mouse button pressed, um, if the state is game over and we click, it will reset the level, right? So that just resets everything, meaning that we basically set game over false, we reset the player, which just sets the player's position back to where it was and re like resets the velocity as well. Um, then we have pillar target and pillar index being reset as well to the default values. And then we recreate those first pillars as the, the, the same way that we did inside level in it. Um, and then, but the cool thing is we don't like, and I deliberately did this, we don't reset the particles or anything, which is quite cool. Cause if you, you, you'll see that if I click to play now, these particles that are here, they will continue kind of flying around, right? So there they are, right? Which is a really cool effect, I think. Um, so if I, you know, create a bunch of particles, they're still kind of there which is super cool. Um, I could have just kept updating the particle system after 
the player crashes, right? And then in that case, um, in that case, you know, it's not going. So for example, let me just quickly demonstrate that. Um, if I just quickly make the, what's the best way to do this? Oh, well, it's actually inside the player. So let's see, player, and then um, update particles. I'll just write it here, particle system on update. We need the time step though, which makes sense. So time step, or do we need hazel time step TS? Um, okay, so we've got update particles. So let's go into the on update function and instead of updating the particle system here, um, we're not going to do that anymore because we're going to update the, we're going to update it here. And then I think level has get player. So if we go back to our game layer, um, and then let's see where's all of this stuff. We'll just do m level get player and then update particles update particles ts right. So we shouldn't see any difference here, but if the game is actually over, our particles will keep kind of disappearing. So that's that's what should happen. <laughs> Hopefully everything works out. So yeah, we have no change here, but if I crash here, you can see they just go away as you would expect, right? So I don't know, I don't think that looks as cool as if they just kind of freeze and then they're there the next time you play. So anyway, that's that's gonna wrap up this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. If I didn't explain something that you wanted to see explained, let me know. I know there's like the collision stuff um, that I'll probably save for like kind of part two um, of this episode if you guys are interested in that. And there's also the particle system, which I know so many of you are interested in and I will, I might dissect that, but then I also want to make a video in which I write a particle system that's a little bit more advanced than what we have here, like within an hour basically and show you guys how to get that up and running and what an, a more efficient way to actually do that is. Let me know what your thoughts are on that in the comment section below. Really just let me know what you want to see um, because obviously I'm making these videos for you guys and you know it's, it's great that I care about explaining this particular part of it, but if you want to see something and I'm missing it, um, then definitely let me know. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button. If you're new, subscribe, and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.